said. Mm -hmm. And so what do you, what, uh, what was, what was the food like in there overall? Cause I, I used to notice that you guys had, had um every now and then we we get the opportunity to see that the things that you guys could purchase on the canteen list and you mm -hmm. guys had a lot of more items than we did they had stopped oh, letting really? us get real sugar yeah because you know guys oh. was making pruno and stuff and a lot yeah. of the things off the package that you guys were allowed to get especially when they came up with the um when we had to order the packages from the vendor you guys was allowed to get a whole lot of stuff like especially huh. kool-aids and stuff that we wasn't allowed to get but oh but, really so how was the food overall though in you know in the chow hall and all that stuff um so the chow hall i i really didn't do the chow hall after a, after a while because you know i i it was gross <laughs> right. you know what i mean it was gross i probably i think i used to go and get like the chicken we would have on chicken nights i would go get the chicken or on hamburger nights go get the hamburger um or maybe some of like the fresh fruit but i didn't really too much deal with the food itself i used to just get my food off canteen or out of my boxes um but you know you you, you we used to make some really good meals shoot with right. the food off canteen and off the boxes you know Mm -hmm. To this day, I still eat my my chili noodles with my beans <laughs> and my right, cheese. Right, it's to this right. day, I I still crave them. Yeah, some of that stuff was extremely good. Were uh -huh. you guys allowed to have uh um uh, or when you left, were you still allowed to have the metal hot pots? Um, we had um, yeah, we did. Yeah, we had hot pots, mm -hmm. and we had um, where they would you you could put put water in it, and it would boil. What was right. that called? I can't, I can't remember what that's called, but yeah, we had them. Well, yeah, I don't no, know how you're it talking is about now. the stinger. You're talking about the stinger. No, we had a stinger, and then we also were able to get like this, um, this like a a bowl that you would put water in and plug it up, and it would um, boil your water in in this bowl type of thing. That's so a hot I, I, pot. I, is it, it a like hot pot? A yeah, that's yeah, a hot okay, pot. Then, yeah, okay, then yeah, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah we, we had that. We were allowed that. Well, because initially when I first came in, people were allowed to have the metal hot pots and they could fry uh, fish in that and all that. Type oh, of no, stuff. we never had no metal hot pot. Yeah, but later no. on, they just they just made it to where we could only have the plastic hot pots and they yeah. couldn't boil. But of course, you know, dudes could go in there and, and rig them to make rig them, them up. They did the same yeah. thing, the same thing. <laughs> yeah, they we used to. to that. Uh huh. We had sinks. I told you we had two sinks in the room. So what we what we used to do is clean one out, clean one of the sinks out really, really well. Put a gar uh, plastic, you know, garbage bag in the sink, fill it with water, and put like three or four stingers at one uh -huh. time, and get a rapid boil. And then that's how we used to cook our food. Right. So you had you had you had um mentioned to me that women actually develop what they call families up in there. Oh yeah, could, yeah. Could you explain how does how does that work? Yeah. So, um, women, we're, we're, you know, we're very like maternal, you know what I mean? And so, right. um, you had, you had families, I'm talking about, you had a mom, a dad, an aunt, an uncle, cousins, kids, uh, everybody, you just had some, some women had entire new families in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I never felt comfortable calling another woman mom because my mom was very active, you know, and, and, right. and coming to see me. And so I just felt some, in a, in a sense, like that would be, I would, I was betraying her or something, you know, in some kind right. of way, Most definitely. but I, I do remember, um, having, um, a sister, you know, calling somebody sissy, you know, or, um, I had, I had women call me their kid, um, things like that. But me particular in particular, I never had this huge family, but the women there, yeah, they create entire families. They create, you know, I'm ta I'm, I mean it moms, dads, kids, aunts and uncles, you know, it's, it's a whole entire family in there. Was it a, was it a lot of women in there with life sentences? Yeah, sadly, sadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so how um basically people always ask me this question. So I want to ask you, how were you able to do all that time? You know, you go to jail, you go to jail, you know, as a teenager, as a kid. And so how were you able to do all the time? Um, thankfully, 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 I had my family that I believe um that really like set the tone for my time there. Because, like I said, I had my visits. I never missed a visit, never missed a quarterly package, never missed a phone call, mail, 
Um, so I was comfortable as much as, as crazy as that sounds, I was comfortable, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, eventually I started to, um, so I worked at the program office, so I got a little bit more extra perks than somebody else, than you know, than someone who didn't, you know. Right. Uh-huh. So for me, I didn't have um, a hard time in there, like like a lot of people experience. I didn't have I didn't have that because I had my family. I was right. comfortable, you know. I I was comfortable. And you know what? You know, you say you say that you're comfortable. You say that you're comfortable. And people may hear that. Uh, well, how, how can a person be comfortable in jail doing a life sentence? But I think it's just like, you know, um, for individuals who haven't done time, some of us, we just have to make the best of a bad situation because right. I mean, you're going to be there regardless. And so be there. being miserable only makes doing time worse. You know, and uh, me, I, I can honestly say I had a lot of fun moments in jail, but I believe mm-hmm. it was due to my personality and right. accepting that, you know, I'm going to be in jail. So, you know, walking right. around miserable is not going to make the situation. Ain't going to work. It's not going to yeah. help. Mm-hmm. It's not going to help. And, and you, you, you know, you would see other miserable people and be I, like, I, dang, I don't, <laughs> it, yeah. it would kind of rub you the wrong way, you right. know? And so I remember thinking, oh my God, I don't want to be like that. You know, I I was fortunate. I had my TV, I had my CD player. I had my 10 CDs that, that, um, I could have, I had, uh, headphones to tune everybody out if I wanted to. I used to uh, work out a lot. And so I was always on the yard if I could be, you know, so I just kind of had my own little world, you know? So you said you used to work out. What, What did that consist of? What was you, uh, what was you doing? So I, um, I ran the track like a crazy person. I didn't care if it was a hundred degrees outside. <laughs> I was mm-hmm. on the track, um, running and, uh, walking and, um, we didn't have weights or anything like that. Right. Um, I think they, they did have them at one time, but they, they got rid of them. Cause I think somebody had used one to, um, hurt someone. Mm-hmm. Um, but we had, um, uh, the resistant bands, you know, things like right. that. So, you know, but mainly my, my thing was jogging. That, that was my thing. That was my getaway. That was my escape was, was being able to jog. Did a lot of, do you think a, um, a high percentage of women in there like exercise and stay fit or. No, not a, not a large percentage. Mm-hmm. Um, really there were, there was a lot of unhealthy big women you know right, right. <laughs> um so if you for someone that that worked out and um kind of kept to themselves that was that was um a very small percentage you know uh, but there were women you know that 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 also did what i did but not not a lot not a right. lot uh-huh and so um when you when you said when you said about uh being grumpy and, and stuff up in there. One particular guy came to mind that I know of. And you know, like, every time I seen him, you know, he was, he was always mad. He was always angry. So that just, you know, every, the, the slightest thing made him upset. And, and I, and I thought the same thing, that must be a miserable way, you know, a miserable way right. to do time, you know, everything, right. him, even when, even when he was in the wrong, you know, right. So it was just, yeah, that, that doesn't, that doesn't make doing, doing time any better. Um, Mm-mm. Is there anything that made you like, miss home um you know more more than others like any type of thing that kind of just you know made you just miss home and think about you know being free and stuff like that so so i I said my father's from trinidad right so Uh growing up um we reggae music was was the the music of choice in our household you know so every year when it got um spring summertime all the reggae festivals start you know happening and so my family they that's what they do and so every year uh I knew that they were gonna go and so that was something that made me like damn <laughs> you know right. that they're 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 gonna be there this year they're gonna be here they get to see this person or that person but um other than that normal Christmas Thanksgiving um birthdays not my own birthday but loved one's birthday Right, you know, because right. I knew, you know, barbecues and get togethers and, you know, things like that. Or um, but other than that, I think I just I just realized that that that's what my reality was for the time being. And if I if I focus too much on on what was going on on the outside and what I wasn't being able to do, that made me um, 
feel some type of way. And right. I didn't like feeling like that. You know what right. I mean? I didn't want to feel homesick. I didn't want to feel like I was missing out. I didn't want to feel I may never get out of here. I didn't want to feel any of that. You know, I just tried to go day by day, right. you know, and make the best. And I, and I definitely could relate to that because I think that's how I dealt with having a lot of time. The way I dealt with it is really just not thinking about, like you said, not thinking right. about, you know, all these type of things and, and what, you know, what I was missing and, and what might be of the future because you really can't do anything about it. You can't except, do nothing uh, about it. Except for worry when you have, see, and that's the bad part about, I think, um, having a life sentence and not knowing when you're going to get home as opposed to a person having, even if you got 10 years, you at least can look to a particular time right. and say, okay, I'm getting out at this such a time. But right. having a life sentence when they wasn't releasing anybody, um, you, you didn't know. And so to didn't me, know. that was, um, that was the, you know, so by me not knowing, I just tried not to even think about it, you know, and I just, right. done time, you know, day by day, you know, and, day uh, by except, day. except it being in prison. Um, and I was going to say that too. And you mentioned it, that, you know, because I, I believe that in women's prison, more than likely, you guys are more able to vent and talk to each other about your problems, your frustration. You know, with guys, right. not so much. You know, we, mm. we was raised to keep all that stuff in. And you have mm. a vast majority of people in the in the male prisons who are part of gangs, you know, or so yeah. that's something that's not, you know, oh, people aren't talking about how, how sad and lonely they are. But I did right. know that holidays was something that, you know, did make a lot of individuals um, get sad, get grumpy. Right. Or whatever, miss, because, miss their families. Right. Yeah, Chris, Chris, Christmas especially. But um, for sure, what was it like? Uh, did 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 they have college programs and stuff? Uh, education. Yeah, yeah, all of that. They had. Um, I think there was two different colleges that you could you could have enrolled into, um, and they had the different vocationals, you know, um, and then all the all the self help groups um, that that were there. They have a ton of self help groups. And actually, myself and uh, four other of my friends who were all, you know, sentenced as adults and, and given life sentence, we 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 formed a self help group, and it's still it's still uh, is active today. It's it was called it's called JOC Juvenile Offenders Committee, and mm -hmm. so that was for you know the young ones that were like us, you know, so. Right. And so how how did you eventually gain your freedom? Because you like you said you were sentenced to 15 years to life. And so you went in when you was 18. So how much time did you actually end up doing it? And how did I you came, actually gain your freedom? Yeah, I came home when I was 30. So um, I did a little bit of a stretch, you know, not 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 as much as others, but I did do a stretch. Um, so I went to board. um so, okay. So my family knew my board, my board hearing was coming up and my brother who I told you moved to Madeira to be with me. Mm -hmm. Um, he was really proactive and he was like, we need to get you a lawyer. I was like, no, cause nobody gets out on their first time around. Um, let's just go. Let me just see what they're talking about. He was like, no, you need a lawyer. I want you to go in there prepared because you know that the, the victim's family, they could be there, you know, right. but, right. but not our family, our family can't, Right. go but but so we were assuming that the victim's family were all going to be in there because they were there through the whole entire court proceeding you know mm -hmm. uh so my brother is really proactive in in um obtaining a lawyer for me and he did he did i i remember i sent him about four or five attorneys and he <laughs> he called each and every one and he said none of them and none of them are going to work i don't want none of them and i said well then mm -hmm. you find somebody then i don't know you know and right. he, he ended up finding me um, my attorney and she stayed with me. She, she rocked it out with me. I went what's, to my, what's her name? I'm just curious if I had, Kater if I had her. yeah, her name is Katera Rutledge. Katera Rutledge. Katera yeah. Rutledge. I think yeah. I've seen her name in some of those. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Fires. Right. Oh yeah. Cause she, she, she helps a lot of people, a lot of people, but, um, she, um, she, anyway, she was my attorney and we, she, she took me to board and she had me, she, she, cause that's what she specializes in, you know, is board mm -hmm. hearings. And so she told me, you need to have a binder. You need to put a binder together of all your accomplishments, all, everything you could think of, family letters, pictures. She said, you need pictures. Let them see that you it, make it personal for the, the commissioners, you know? So I went in there with the binder, a thick binder, you know, it took me a long time to complete, but um, she fought for me and I was, I was one of the lucky ones. 
that I was found suitable on my very first uh, board hearing, found suitable. So about what year was that? Maybe 2012? No, no. I came home um, in 2011. So that okay. might have been two. That might have been. Two, oh, God, maybe maybe the beginning of 2010, maybe. Right. Um, okay. I can't remember specifically, but but, um, you know, you got to wait if you get granted, you know, you got to wait the 120 is 120 days, 120 right. days, huh? Uh, um, I think it's, well, I think it's 150 for, for people who have a, uh, a, a, a first degree murder or okay. second degree and it, it's 90 days for a person that has an attempted murder. Okay. Well, I had to wait the six, the, the, the hundred. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but that's when Schwarzenegger was in office and he denied, you know, my parole. So that's when my attorney, um, uh, filed, uh, an appeal and, right. and appealed that decision because her, her whole thing was if the commissioner saw fit, why do you get to deny, you know? Right. Um, so, so she, let, let, me, let me explain that for the, for the, um, uh -huh. for the viewers. So the way the uh, appeal process works in California is you go, you go to your, um, you go to your hearing or whatever. And so they found her what they call out here. They found you suitable, which basically mm -hmm. says they, they, you know, um, your parole is upcoming, but the governor still has 150 days to to review the findings. And um, he has the power to reverse or veto the decision right. from the parole board. And so that's what he done in her case. As right. I mentioned to you earlier, a lot of times they, they wasn't letting anybody with life out of prison. And, and the small time that a person was found suitable, the governor had the power to to reverse the decision. So right. what was it like after you waiting all that time? Oh. You know hoping and praying you're going home, then you get a call to the counselor's office saying that the governor had reversed that decision. Uh, it broke me. I, I remember um, I was sitting there, the time the, the time had expired and I didn't hear anything, you know? And my, my, my wife at the time, we were sitting there and she said, she, she, she kept, she, she was very optimistic. And I said, I have a feeling, I just, something in my, my gut is telling me I, I um, it's this, this ain't my time. And she says, you need to go to your counselor. And I said, I don't want to go to my counselor. I, right. I, I felt like no news was good news in a sense, mm -hmm. but, um, but still, I still felt it wasn't my time, you know? And so she made me go, we walked down to, to my counselor's office and she told me that I had been denied, you know? And so I remember crying at that point because my family, they were just, they were right. buying me clothes at that time. And, right. you know, and that's Plenty. what I was thinking. That was one of the hardest things you're gonna have to do. Break it, Tell break it to your family. mom and your family. Cause you yep. know, keep in mind you had mentioned earlier how your mom said, you know, I just I just can't take this can't no, do more. It no more. And I remember mm -hmm. when I was found suitable, my mom asked me maybe about a month or two after I was found suitable. She said, well, you know, Eric, are you really coming home? And so that, yeah. you know, that's, that's like you say, just uh, having to break that news to, to, to mom. It's terrible. Right. It's terrible. Is it? Right. it was terrible. I remember the, the, the visit was really like just sad and, and, and down and out, you know, but I remember, I think I, I, I only allowed myself two to three days to stay that way. Cause I said, if you got found suitable once you got, you're going to get found suitable again. And so I started, you know, two to three days later, I was back at my groups, you know, back doing what I was supposed to do. Um, but I also knew my attorney, you know, at that time, she, she was like, okay, well, I'm going to file an appeal. And so she filed that appeal. And in the process of, me waiting for my appeal, um, I went back to board because I think you get to wait six months after that decision, if my memory serves me right, before you could go back to board again at that time, you know. So I, I went back to board six months after that and I got found suitable again. Mm -hmm. So now I have my appeal in the court and being found suitable for a second time. So I knew one of these <laughs> One of these chances coming up, it, it, it had to be, I had to go home on one of those chances. And I did. Right. I got out. I remember I've had a couple of buddies that I was in there with actually be found suitable and um, twice. And the, the, uh, the governor snatches, snatches it, reverses both times. I was actually uh, locked up with an individual who, who was part of the Charles Manson gang. And I think he's oh, been yeah. suitable six or seven times at each time the, the governor reverses the decision. So, right. um, 
And another friend of mine, he was telling me that he, he had been found suitable. And so and they did uh, they reversed it. And then so he went again later and was found suitable again. And he said that was just extremely nerve wracking, not knowing what, what was going to happen. You know, <laughs> um, that's that's probably more nerve wracking than going to the board, you know. But uh, yeah. Eventually, the second time they didn't they didn't allow that guy. I mean, they they didn't mess with his suitability, and he was able to good. go home. So, Very so good. on yours. So, what happened with so your second one? How did how did how did you end up going home? On which was it the the appeal or the? Uh, I got out on my appeal. Yeah, oh, okay. I got I got out on my appeal. So I don't even know if the governor would have if he would have granted me or not. I don't know because my my appeal came through, and. Um, I remember I, I called my, I called my mom. That's what I called my mom and um, just on a fluke one morning and, and she was crying and she said, you're coming home. You're coming home. I was talking about, she said, you, Katera hasn't called you. And I go, no, what are you talking about? And, and, and they had heard the news before I had heard the news, you know? Mm. So, so then I hung up with my mom and, and called my attorney and she said that, that, that my appeal, we had won, we had won my appeal. And so of course it takes, I, I don't remember how soon after that I, I, I got released, but I know s shortly after, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what, what was that, what was that like to you to finally know that you was on your way home and <sighs> after, after all that time, having a life sentence, not knowing that you was, you know, that, that when you was coming home, what was that, what was that like? Oh my God. It was, I was working in the program office, you know, like I said at that time. And, and, uh, once I got wind, uh, uh, of me going, uh, being found, uh, winning my appeal. Oh my God. I stayed on the lieutenants and the captain. And, and did you find anything? Did you find anything? Did you hear anything? Um, but it, it was nerve wracking. I gave all my stuff away. And I remember <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I had a one CO, Oh my God. I, and me and my friend, we were just talking about him. I, Oh, he was horrible. He used to tell me, you're not going home. Don't count your chickens before your eggs hatch. He told me that every time he seen me wow. and I said, they're counted. Listen, my, my, they're counted. I'm out of here, you know, cause at this time I just had it. I just, it was done. You know, I knew I was leaving. I gave my TV away. I, all my hygiene's away. I my clothes away. I gave everything away. And then I thought, well, shit, you ain't, you didn't get your parole ducky. Yeah. You, <laughs> you might've acted too soon, you know? But, so, so who, who was the CEO? Was he a was he a, a minority or black CEO or? Mm -mm, he was a Mexican guy, and he wow. he just yeah. And and the ironic thing about that is, after I paroled, me and my friend were walking in the mall, and I seen him. Him and wow. I made uh, yeah, we locked eyes, and I kind of just started like I chuckled. Now he was with his wife, and his he had two small kids at the time, so I didn't, you know. Right. Were you all wrong like, at that time? Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. So I didn't do anything crazy. But right, I remember right. walking past him and said, I counted my chickens before they hatched. Because yeah. he knew what I meant. You right, know? right. <laughs> I was just thinking if, if it was me and I was off the roll, I probably would have flipped <laughs> him off. I would have said something <laughs> to him. But see, and that's that goes back to what we was talking about earlier, how, you know, a lot of these guards, they'll go. Uh, over and beyond in, oh. in being, you know, in being mean, wh whether it's mentally torturous, wh whether it's verbally. And for no reason. For no reason. No and a lot reason. of people who, who've never been in trouble, they don't understand that they assume, you know, when, um, cause maybe when they get pulled over, you know, um, they have, they have uh, nice interactions with the police. So right. they can't, they can't believe that law enforcement can be right. mean and sadistic, but a lot of them fail to realize that the COs, just because they're COs, they're human. You know, they have right. emotions. <laughs> Certain things upset them and make them angry. And, you know, they take advantage of their job like anybody else. Just like the person at Burger King might give their buddies some extra fries. Right. The person who's working at the movie theaters might let their buddies come in for free. All that type of stuff, you know. Right. I don't believe there's not one job that a person works where he doesn't take advantage of it at, sure. at some point in time. And so that's what they do. You know, they they you know they try to punish us. They try to, uh, you know, they go out of our, our, their way to make our lives difficult when they don't have to, you know. For sure. Yeah. And, and it's not, you know, there, there were a lot of good CEOs, some right. that I'm still in touch with today, you know, that, that, um, like we still talk till today, you know, uh, but, but, but there are some in there that are just nasty, you know, for no reason, no, no reason. reason at all. Right. And it's like, God, 
I don't know. I, I, I luckily, I, I did have a few of those encounters, but for the most part, like I said, because I worked, I was a lieutenant's clerk, so no one really bothered me like that, you know, because they always seen me up there at the office, and so. But I just and I but I wasn't out there acting acting a fool either, you know, so maybe that has something to do with it. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. So what what is it like? OK, so now you finally get the information. You're going home. You know, you're going home. But the next day, what's that last day in prison like for you? Um, I, I, see, I, I, Real quick, though, you was you was you was you was different for me. I didn't give all my stuff away until I finally <laughs> got the word that, I, you know, I, I was going, I kept all my stuff basically you kept your the, stuff. Day, the day before, maybe two or three days before, you know, then I started passing it out. But, uh, so you, Honey, I cleaned my away. locker out. I cleared my, <laughs> I cleared it out. I cleared my drawer out. I think I kept probably a tube of toothpaste and a bottle of, uh, a body wash, you know, but uh -huh. for the most part, I cleared it out and, um, I just wanted to go. I wanted to get out of there the the day before, I remember my stomach being real sick because we got our ducats the night before. And uh -huh. so I remember my nerves being real bad because I knew from the captain, I was su supposed to be expecting my ducat that night, you right. know, but my mind was playing tricks on me. I'm not going to get my ducat. I'm not going to get my ducat, you know? So I remember, I think they passed ducats out um, right after our, af after we locked down but before count time. And so I remember th those, those 10, 15 minute window, um, I was sick. I was mm -hmm. sick to my stomach. I was at the door and I was watching down the hallway, seeing when he was coming, you know, and, and when he got to my room and gave me my ducket, I just, I dropped. I did. Yeah. I dropped. Yeah. Cause I seen my name and it said parole, um, R and R 815, you know, AM, you know, and, and so, right. yeah, it, it, it was a beautiful moment. Mm -hmm. And then, so you know, you finally uh, were were you able to sleep? Because a lot of people said they wasn't no. able to sleep. On, <laughs> no. on my last night, I I slept like a baby. You know, and, uh, I don't know how you did <laughs> how you did that. No, I didn't sleep. I was up and I, watching TV, and I think I, I I'm sure I dozed off a little bit, but I was up bright and early. Took a shower and 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 just got ready. Had my my little belongings that I did take with me. You know, letters and pictures and stuff like that, but. Um, no, I, I didn't sleep at all. It was emotional, you know, it was emotional. Right. And so, um, when, when your family pick you up and, and you, and you get outside the prison, what are some of the first things that you did? Um, so I had three car loads of people here, um, that, that came to pick me up. Mm -hmm. I have to plug my phone and I'm sorry, it's going to die. Um, okay. I had three, three car loads of people here. Um, so sorry, one second. And um, we went to my brother's house and they had a whole, they had a whole um, thing planned. They had food galore, you know, that was everywhere. Um, they had just, everything was planned, you know. Um, they yeah. had so much yeah. food. I remember uh, looking at the food and feeling sick. Like I cannot even mm. think about <laughs> eating this food. Like. Oh my God. And it just, the greasiness of it and all the barbecue and stuff. I said, Oh God, I didn't, I don't think I ate too much. I don't remember eating too much at all, you know, but, um, yeah, we just went home and, and, uh, I remember a football game was on and the TV was on, so loud on surround sound and my brothers were hollering and, and it was just like an overload for me, you know? Right. So, so that's, I know that's that's lovely. You know, you finally get out, you get to be with your family and all that type of stuff. And so uh, what have you been up to, you know, um, after doing that time? Were you able to transition back to the streets? All right. And yeah. So, again, I had my my family support, you know, so um, they this time around, they didn't let me even get comfortable with uh being back out on the street as far as that goes, you know, Um so I, I remember I started working as soon as I could. I, I worked full time. I went to school full time um, and I did that for a long time. And then I was pretty active in my church back then. You know, I volunteered a lot and um, did did a lot of things with that, you know. Um, 
and then eventually I met my husband and, and, and now I have my little girl. And so she keeps me on my feet and, and, you know, just I'm normal now. I have a normal life. I, I go to work every day and drop her off at school, pick her up and uh, go home, cook dinner and live a normal life now. Well, congratulations. And so I'm sitting here in my head trying to do the math. And so you've been out, you've been out 10 years. years. I've been out maybe about four. And for me, it feels like I've never even went to prison. Like you said, you settled into a normal life and all that type of stuff. How does it feel for you? Does it feel that you actually went to prison or how did, how, you know? Yeah. So I, my, me and my, we, my friend and I, we talk about this a lot. She did, I think uh, about 25 years. Um, mm -hmm. She now, she just had her five-year anniversary, but um, prison is something that will never, ever leave me. You know, at some point during the day, every day, um, I think about it. You know, mm -hmm. it could be four o'clock, and I know that's that, that 4.15 is, is count time, or, right. you know, or, or I'll hear a song that came out when I was there, and it just I just have a memory of it or something, right, you know. Right. Um, yeah, it, 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 and, and still like, there's a lot of things I don't know and things that I've had to learn where someone else, my age, who's never went away, didn't have the type of troubles that I had, you know? Right. Um, I remember when I first came home, I used to feel someone could look at me until I just came home. Like they knew <laughs> <laughs> that I was in prison and my friend was like, no. No one knows jazz. And I'm like, he can tell, you can tell. And I was like kind of paranoid a little bit, you know, right. but um, I think I've acclimated pretty well. I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right out, out, out here. Mm -hmm. And all the things that you mentioned, I definitely, I definitely can, um, can relate to those you know i don't i don't uh like you say sometimes i'll hear a certain song or something will happen and i'll relate it to prison because i've been there so long but i was just talking about for me i just don't i just don't i don't um i don't feel like you know i still have the memories and stuff of course but i just don't feel like i was ever locked up it all to me it almost seems like like a, a dream you know dream. now a couple of days ago i was driving down the street and i seen somebody being arrested he was handcuffed and then that really that really just shook me up like damn you know just you know just thinking like you know because i'm i'm knowing from from that point what it what he's supposed to go through in the experience and for some reason yeah. that really gave me the heebie-jeebie seeing him handcuffed but you know um it gives me anxiety when i see right. somebody, uh you know getting getting arrested or pulled over it has nothing to do with me at all right but my nerves are bad <laughs> so you know i don't i don't know but um i don't have any interactions with with law enforcement today thankfully you know right right and so you know jasmine a, I'm, i like to just congratulate you on you know coming home your freedom your uh your relationship your your marriage your baby you know your new life and everything i um especially like to thank you for coming on here being willing to share your story you know and um hopefully you know, you have some people out there that hear your story and, and they'll they'll realize that how it, it how easy it is to, you know, one day just be doing something and the next day be locked up in prison. You know, if yeah. so hopefully it'll, it'll it'll help somebody make the uh, the right choices, stay on the right path. And uh, once again, like I say, congratulations and thank, thank you for coming on, sharing your story with me. I really sure. appreciate it. Jasmine, thank for you guys who may or not know, she reached out to me. Um, maybe six or seven months ago, five, six months ago, but I had to wait and try to get my little, you know, like, like she was saying, and, and with me, technology, I don't know nothing about none of this stuff, you know, so people have to help me and get all this stuff hooked up now to where I can do these interviews and stuff like that. But I really appreciate you, Jasmine, you know, uh, thank you for, you know, tuning in my page and just all that type of stuff and especially sharing your story, you know. For sure. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. So. Mm-hmm. And so you enjoy the rest of your day Thanks. and I should probably have this interview up four or five days or whatever. I'll definitely let you know. Um, okay. And once again, thank you, you know. Yeah. Have a good day. All bye. right. You too. All right. Bye-bye.